Muy bien. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I am so glad to be here to present on gender diversity and inclusion. I am Shauna Green. My pronouns are they, them. Here is all of my contact information. I am I used to be a bit more chatty on social media, but, you know, life be life. And, but if you have any questions or want to connect after, please feel free. Um, by day, I am a IT manager for a tech company. Uh, I am also a pastor of a sweet Mennonite church here in Kansas. Um, and I get to do this, uh, teach diversity, inclusion, and belonging to wonderful groups like you. <clears throat> so to get started, so we have a little over an hour today. So if I start talking like uh, I'm selling cars at the car show, just put in the chat for me to slow down and I will make that happen. Um, but one thing I want to remind us all is that you uh, came here today to either learn, to grow your awareness. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe because your job said you had to, not my business, I don't know. Um, but I would like to offer that this subject can be very emotional. This subject can bring up a lot of feelings and opinions and views. Um, but one thing I like to tell people is that your resistance to what we talk about today, if you begin to feel like, mm, I don't know about that, Shauna, or mm, I don't agree with that, it's just an opportunity to increase your awareness, to grow, to examine and investigate some of the thoughts and feelings that you may have about some things. Um, and I encourage you to do that. Um, this is not simply a lecture. You did not accidentally sign up for college today. Um, so feel free to chat back, raise your hands, use the different tools in Zoom to get my attention. Um, if you have questions, and I am more than happy to go over those. So getting started, I always like to start with just some things about identity. So when we talk about identity, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. Your identity may be wrapped up in who you are or whose you are or who you take care of. Um, for me, I am a veteran. I am um, married to a woman. I am a lesbian. I am the L in the LGBTQ. Uh, I have a new new 18-year-old son who finds ways every day to call and ask me for DoorDash and burritos and Chick-fil-A and all sorts of other things. Um, I am a pastor and a few other things. So when you go through this, think about where you fall into identity um, and then think about how that identity influences the spaces that you are in, the access that you have. As a Black person, or person of color, the intersections of my identity mean different things when I'm in different places. So I want you to think about your own social location and how your identity impacts, whether it's accessibility to care, access to resources, privilege, and some of those other things. So when we talk about gender diversity, one thing that we have to be real clear on is language. Oh, we're going quick. Is language, <laughs> and what that language means to multiple other people. So today we're going to go over some descriptions and definitions so that we are all on the same page as we talk about what the language means to us and how that language impacts who we're working with and the communities that we are in. So gender, I like to start with the big one and get that out the way first. 
So gender are the characteristics of women, men, girls, boys that are socially constructed. If you don't remember nothing else from this training, I hope you remember it all, but we know how it goes. If you don't remember anything else, gender is a social construct. Gender is what, as a society, we utilize to say things like boys wear blue and girls wear pink or girls play with dolls and boys play with trucks. Um, it is not, it has nothing to do, gender has nothing to do with uh, biological assigned sex or anything of that nature. It is what society has said to us about what attributes, what traits, what roles um, we have based on what our biological sex is. So that takes us to biological sex. That's the label that you're given at birth based on those medical factors, hormones, chromosomes, genitals. Um, most people are assigned male or female. Uh, there are some percentage of the population that are born and that classification is a little more ambiguous. Um, they may have elements of what is assigned male at birth and elements of what is assigned female at birth. And those uh, that determination of biological sex is called intersex. Um, before, uh, in times gone by, in generations gone by, the term that was used was hermaphrodite, and that term is no longer used. The term that we use is intersex. There's a lot of controversy around intersex um, because very often the decision as to what side to lean on, whether that is assigned male or assigned female, is left to the parents at such an early age before developmental things can be seen, which can cause things like gender dysphoria um, and just a misalignment with who a person actually grows up to be. The next term is cisgendered. So cisgendered is denoting or relating to a person whose personal identity and their biological sex corresponds with the gender identity that they're showing up as. So cis biologically and in chemistry uh, scientifically just means same. Um, there has been a lot of um, argument over in social media and among women, especially who don't want to be called cisgendered um, because for whatever reason, they feel that it diminishes who they are as women when the reality of it is that the term cis just means same. It is like all labels, it's just an easier way to get to the, as my grandma would say, the nitty gritty of who you are and how you're showing up in a world that's full of different identities and different social things. So saying cisgendered is not a slight. It is not diminishing someone's value or lived experience. It is simply a shortcut to saying that a person's biological sex <laughs> and their gender identity is the same. Alongside that is transgender. So a transgendered person is a person that has a gender identity or expression that differs from their biological sex. So someone could be assigned, someone would be assigned, for example, male uh, at birth, biologically male based on um, the presence of male sexual organs, hormones, and as they get older, um, begin uh, the process or recognize that that gender identity does not align with who they are. And so they begin to live and to experience life as a woman. That person would be considered transgender. So I know you all watch the news. Well, maybe it, it could be a lot sometimes, but I am sure you have at least heard the stirrings of a lot of legislation and a lot of things surrounding uh, transgendered people and those who are of a transgender identity. Um, and a lot of that is based on a lack of understanding, uh, a deep-seated or deep 
um, feeling concerning biological sex and the lack of um, connection or the lack of understanding of gender as a social construct. Um, and so that's where that comes from. There are also terms like turf um, that get thrown around and that's ex uh, trans exclusionary radical feminists. Um, those are people who do not, um, do not accept or do not stand alongside the thought that trans women are women um, and would prefer that that be a separate category. So for example, as someone who self identifies as a turf would say, we're having a woman's conference and we want that for natural women only. And that's their words, not mine. Uh, trans women are women. Um, but typically a turf or someone who is more trans exclusionary would uh, feel that. Um, another element of that trans piece that I think is really important is that regardless of where a person is in their transition does not denote whether they are trans or not. What we fail to see in this capitalistic patriarchal society that we live in is that is also impacted by white supremacy and white body supremacy is that transitioning for some is a privilege that they don't have access to. Not everyone has access to gender affirming health care um, where they're able to get their hormones or they're able to do uh, different surgeries um, that make it um, that make it more society or socially acceptable. So just because a person, for example, um, what I see a lot now and what I have a lot of conversations around are people in their 40s and 50s and sometimes even 60s finally being able to come out as transgender. They've already lived a whole life as their biological sex, which may have included marriage or children, and they finally feel that either they have the courage, uh, they have the ability, or they feel safe enough to come out. Well, in your 40s and 50s, and sometimes even in your late 20s and 30s, a lot of the gender affirming care and hormones no longer have the same impact as they would on someone who's younger, prepubescent. Um, and so sometimes they may only transition in their hair length, or they may only transition in the clothes that they wear or in a name change. But the ability to fully transition and not be uh, in the LGBTQ communities, the term that's usually used is clocked. When someone can look at you and clock you and see that, oh, this person was biologically this first or whatever the case may be. Another term would be passing. The ability to pass is a privilege and we have to be mindful that the truest indicator of who a person is or what a person would like to be referred to is themselves and what they tell you. We cannot make assumptions based on nail polish, uh, hair color, uh, clothing, outfits. Uh, we really have to allow people to uh, exist, to live, and to share who they are without these grand coming out ceremonies. No one owes you. I've never heard a straight person come out in my life. No one has ever come to me and be like, hey, Shauna, how you doing? Um, you know, I'm heterosexual. Like, I've never heard that to date. Now, if any of you have a grand secret you want to tell me, you can share with me. But um, this idea and this thought that in passing or in... Um, relationship that people owe you a coming out um, is archaic and it's barbaric. Now, when it comes to romantic relationships and relationships with someone that will go deeper than I work with you and my name is uh, Tony, um, that's a different conversation on the type of things that a person ought to disclose and talk about. But we're just talking about community relationships today. Gender identity. Gender identity is your individually held feelings of whether you're female, male, both, or neither. In our society, gender is very much on a binary. A binary typically means a choice out of two things, bi being two, 
Um, and so it's either male or female. And uh, um, a lot of people who don't spend time in scientific communities or haven't read or not as read or versed think that that's the only way to go when the reality is whether we're talking animals, insects, uh, science, language, Latin, um, English, and American society is one of the most binary societies. Other societies are not that way. In indigenous, indigenous and native societies, there's, there's often more than two, so it's not as binary. Even in a lot of languages, there is a neutral um, for language that doesn't include male or female characteristics. So when it comes to gender identity, it's not something that someone can look at you and be like, okay, Jonathan, I can see you and here's your gender identity. I got it. I know it. No, gender identity is something that you get to determine and you get to share because it's not assigned at birth. So before we jump into sexual orientation, I do want to say this, uh, especially with a lot of the legislator legislation and especially with a lot of the conversation around gender identity and sexual orientation as it relates to our youth, um, BIPOC, and when I say BIPOC, we know that's Black, and, um, Black Brown, Indigenous people of color. Um, so I'm gonna be even more specific. Black and brown youth of trans identities and Black trans women are the hot, most targeted, most marginalized, most oppressed. They experience the highest rate of violence and housing insecurity. And so one thing I wanna share with us today about gender identity is that gender identity and sexual orientation are two very different things. When a child, a minor, an adolescent says that they have, uh, that they are of a different gender identity. It has nothing to do with sex. And in the news and in certain circles, uh, that line gets blurred as a tactic for rhetoric um, and to swing opinions. A child that says, I am a child that is biologically assigned girl, a uh, girl female at birth that says, I am trans, I am a boy, I want to go by this name whatsoever. They are not saying they are gay. They're not saying they are lesbian. They are not saying that they are ready to just be out here uh, on the next Netflix special doing the most. What they are saying is that they, in their person, have recognized that their gender, that as parents, as community members, as family members, the gender assignments and rules that we're setting upon them are out of alignment. Um, and so there's a lot of conversations on, and a lot of states have banned gender affirming care. I have friends who have had to uproot their entire lives and move because social services was threatened to take their children away because they've allowed them and they've aided them in uh, affirming gender care. Sexual orientation is who you're attracted to and who you feel drawn to. And that can be romantically, emotionally, and sexually. It is not strange or out of the ordinary for a person, for a woman to say, well, I'm, I'm sexually attracted to women, but I'm more romantically attracted to men. That happens. Or those three things can be in exact alignment. Um, but it is on a spectrum. And, and we'll talk a little more about that later. So when you think of sexual orientation, even when it relates to trans people, and I, this, this is where it's okay, you might need a graph or a chart, I should make one. A person who is assigned female at birth transitions to male and is a transgender male may have an attraction for women and consider themselves straight. Use the chat to let me know if you still with me, if, if, if that makes sense. <laughs> so sexual orientation, someone can be assigned male at birth, transition to female, and 
men to have an attraction and a sexual orientation towards women and be considered a lesbian. So, I mean, we probably need a Venn diagram or something, but so there are a lot of different ways these things show up and a lot of different ways our bias can influence how we look at people and how we communicate with people. Um, I know for me, um, I knew that I was a, a lesbian or gay very young. Um, but I also knew in my Black Catholic household that the devil was a lie. It was not going to happen up in there. Um, and so I lived a what we call a compulsory heteronormative life where society and our culture is geared at heterosexuality. And so I just faked it till I made it. Um, I married my high school best friend who also knew that he had same gender attraction. We figured we tried it out a few times. I had, had a kid and then we was like, you know what? This might not be what this ain't, this math ain't math. And let's try something else. I served in the military during don't ask, don't tell. And so if it were found, found out that I was same gender attracted, I could have been court-martialed, kicked out, lose rank, dishonorably discharged, which would have impacted my career and my life for the rest of my life. And so thinking about sexual orientation and how that shows up in our lives, I have an uncle in his seventies. We all know that uh, my uncle is not my, uh, my godfather's best friend. We know that's his boyfriend, but he grew up in a time in Washington, D.C. where it was not acceptable. And so just thinking about those things um, as a Black person, even in Black community, so I always think about oppression on a, in a bit of a, a iceberg. So when you think about white supremacy, we know how Black people are impacted by that. But in Black communities, it's the same with homosexuality and the inherent homophobia that exists in some black and brown communities is very isolating and very dangerous for some, which is also why they may not come out. And you may look and think, you know, but you will not be receiving confirmation because folks don't want to lose their homes and their families and their church communities. So the alphabet soup, as I like to call it, can stand for a lot of different things in a lot of different communities for some of the letters. The L is generally very much lesbian, the G, gay, uh, women or people of a, uh, experiencing uh, this world as women typically sometimes pick the L. Sometimes they use the G. Sometimes there's other little languages and other pockets of communities that folks use. Um, the B is for bisexual. So there's that binary again, uh, the two. So that's male or female. Um, the T is transgender. Um, sometimes it's for transitioning. Uh, the Q, depending on what generation you're from, can mean different things. Uh, the generation, let me see, I'm going to tell on myself how old I am, but um, a couple generations before mine, how about I do it that way, queer was a slur and it was a very negative term. But in the last couple generations, we've begun to reclaim that word to kind of just say, you know, I'm not fitting into any of these other categories, but uh, I'm also not uh, heterosexual or straight. Um, the Q can also stand for questioning. Uh, you're not quite sure. It could go either way, but you're not ready to pick another one of those letters. We also have in indigenous communities, two-spirit. Um, the I, intersex. Um, the A, um, some people use it for allyship. Uh, I don't because I feel like straight people um, non-people of color, white people, um, and other allies, they get all the other letters of the alphabet. They are centered in every single acronym on this whole earth. We can barely have the NAACP. It is Black History Month. I am not giving that A to allies. You got everything else. Have that. The A for B and for a, a lot of people is asexual. Now, asexual is a bit different. And that it doesn't necessarily mean that someone's sexual orientation 
is um, homosexual or not heterosexual. Asexual has more to do with a person's desire um, to engage uh, in sex. Um, so the term uses ace. You also have aero and demo and demi. There are people who only can have sexual intercourse deeply within a romantic uh, relationship. There are people who do not have a desire uh, physically to engage in sexual acts, but all of those are represented in this uh, LGBTQ2IA plus banner. Are there any questions? Um, now, I know I only got an hour, which the, the thing I'm willing to sacrifice for questions is breakouts. We don't have to do breakout groups if you just want to hang out in here with me. I would understand that because I'm kind of nice. But uh, let's open it up to questions on anything that we have talked about. The LGBTQ gender, uh, gender identity, that convoluted uh, orientation chart of assigned romantic <laughs> of relationships that I gave you. So y'all just not gonna have no questions. Y'all just knew all this before and we could have just been in here talking about our favorite Black History Month creator. Okay. If you would rather not chat, you can put it in the chat as well. Thank you, Emily. Ooh, I was about to say this group, I have done trainings for this group for years and people always be having a lot to say. Somebody must have told you about my material um, and stole my shine. Um, Two-spirit is really interesting. And there are cultures all throughout this world, uh, even in Africa um, and Africa, certain parts of Africa are known for their anti-gay legislation um, and some of those colonial uh, practices now. But there were societies where queer people were the elders, the leaders, the healers um, in a society because they had that mix of what we call feminine and masculine energies and, and some of those things. Um, so that dates back much, much further than what we know of Christianity, what we know of uh, colonization. Um, so it is a really interesting thing to dig into and research. Um, one of the resources that I offer at the end um, is a book about African-American trans identities through history um, that is really good. Um, going along the lines of two-spirit, how does the identity differ? Ooh, awesome, awesome. Um, so there are, once you get out of the binary of uh, uh, male, female, boy, girl, there are other identities. There are um, non-binary, meaning I don't subscribe to none of these and I'm going to do what I want. There's gender non-conform gender non-conforming, which is along the same lines. Uh, there's gender fluid, meaning on day to day, you better check with me because I'm I'm gonna give you whatever I give you today. And it's really none of your business. Maybe I'm adding that part because that's how I flow, but uh <laughs> maybe I'm projecting a little bit on that none of your business part. Um, so it, it does vary. Even when it comes to sexual orientation, I didn't mention some other ones. So there's pansexual. Um, and pansexual generally means that you are attracted to a variety of gender identities, that a person can be male, female, non-binary, trans, gender fluid. It's really that I love the person in whatever package they're showing up in. Um, there's also sapiosexuals. Sapiosexuals are uh, people who are attracted to intelligence and brilliance and who um, it may not it may not matter what the body comes in or what the person comes in and maybe it does, but they are very much uh, turned on and attracted to a certain level of intelligence. Um, I can I can see some of your minds working. You're coming out as sapiosexual tomorrow. I just know it. I can, I can see it on some of your faces. 
So people and pronouns. Um, this pronoun conversation is so interesting. Um, I would like to offer that I know all of you can use pronouns because we do it all the time in other conversations. So I know what the I know the problem with pronouns is not people's ability to do it and to use it. Maya Angelou is one of my favorite ancestors. And one of the things she said uh, is do the best you can until you know better. Then when you, when you know better, do better. I would like to add a little piece to Auntie Maya's ancestral wisdom. Do the best you can until you know better. Once you know better, you got to apply it. If you go out here and ride a bike and go to the gym and work out and do 500 jumping jacks and you think that you just going to get the shower, rinse off and get out and you're going to be fresh like the meadow, you are in deception. There, You can know a lot of things, but if you don't begin to apply that knowledge like soap <laughs> and apply those things, do better is much further in the future. I don't believe that people make mistakes or people misgender or that people are homophobic or say little snide things because they don't know better. It is uh, the year of Beyonce 2024. It, we don't need no more books. We don't need no more docu-series. We don't need no more webinars. We don't need any more martyrs. The amount of information that exists and is at your fingertips in these thousand dollar cell phones, there is no reason that someone doesn't know. The reality is, is people know they are intentionally harmful. They intentionally refuse to do the work to gain access to information. And it's what they want to do, which takes me to Auntie Maya's second quote. When someone shows you who they are, believe them. Um, I I am not, uh, I won't even say the quote, so I don't even, I won't even say who said this because I don't even want to have to say their name because I don't really like them. But I heard in a podcast once that a person My apologies, Shauna. I was trying to admit someone from the uh, waiting room and I accidentally muted you. You should be there. You go. The host, <laughs> what happened was my quote. This wasn't even the raciest thing I've said yet. <laughs> no, my, my apologies. I was trying to admit someone. Um, and Thank I you. Thank You're you. Fun. But the quote is, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. So you can spend all that time trying to convince somebody of something. You can spend all that time trying to get someone to see your side, to understand you, to change their mind. But if a person doesn't have a willingness, they're the same and they carry those same opinions. So I'm trying to help you save yourself and protect your peace because people who feel things about these subjects, people think that think trans children don't deserve gender affirming care um, before the dysphoria and ideations and ruminations and all that set in, people that think that trans women don't deserve um, to be called about the names they've chosen um, or think that police should not investigate or uh, convict those found guilty of harming trans people all of those things, they gonna think that whether you spend your good, good time trying to educate and trying to convince them if they want to. That's not me saying don't have these conversations. That's not me saying after this class, don't call up your friend and be like, oh girl, that trainer we had today, top notch, okay? Please do that. But don't lose your peace over a person who is intentionally harmful. Inclusion versus equity. Y'all been in these classes. I know you know the, the understanding of it. Inclusion is providing equal access. Belonging for me is about equitable access and a person not just feeling invited, but feeling welcome to be their full authentic self. So it's not just like, oh, yes, we invite people of all dot, 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 whether that's race, sex, gender. Um, and meanwhile, you get in there and there's homophobic activities. There's people being disrespectful. Um, no, that's not inclusive or belonging. 
But in our organizations, we really should be striving that people feel like they belong, that they don't feel like they're the diversity hire or diversity community members, that we're not tokenizing and fetishizing queer people just so it looks like we're more affirming than we really are. A word that I've mentioned a couple times is intersectionality. Intersectionality is a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. The idea of intersectionality has existed for a long time. The term um, came from Kimberly Crenshaw. And it's this idea of having a lens where you can see where power interlocks and intersects. So it's not just that something is happening in our community because someone is gay, right? Or because someone is queer. The reality is it may be, uh, they may be of a differing identity. They may be of a differing race. There, it may be a gender issue. It may be a class issue. Um, it's one of those situations, I'll, I'll put it in a non-queer way so people can understand it. When we think about Martin Luther King, um, and we think about the, um, the life uh, and the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A lot of people say, well, Martin Luther King was assassinated because he was Black, right? A lot of people will say Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated because he spoke out about racial injustice and civil rights. The reality or the underlying piece along with those things is Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated because he had begun to unpack and bring the discussion of class and economic values and was about to start the Poor People's Campaign, which would have taken that conversation to another national and to the next level. So you can't just say it was because he was Black. You can't just say because he was vocal. You can't just say it was because he was an activist. You have to look at the intersections of everything that was happening to really get a good understanding and a good grasp about what happened. That's what we have to do for one another and in our communities too. Because if you only look at one piece, let's say someone comes to you, let's say you work as part of an organization that helps with, that helps the unhoused and you have an unhoused person. Let's say this unhoused person is trans um, they are uh, um, Black. They uh, have job insecurity as well, so um, or they have a disability, so they may get some additional benefits, Social Security or something like that. And now your job is to house them. If you're only looking at the Black part, you're like, okay, we have some housing in this beautiful Black neighborhood. I'm sure they'll feel comfortable here. They don't got to deal with the racism that's happening on the east side of town. Um, the landlord is great. Boom. Well, they move in. Someone finds out they're trans and busts all the windows out their car. Because you didn't have your intersectional lenses on. So let's say, okay. We found them a community. It is near um, a gender affirming doctor's office. Um, it is a beautiful, mixed, uh, diverse community. Everything is great. I can get them in there. Uh, the rent is $900 a month. Well, their state benefits are only $1,100. How they go eat, honey? What they go do? They go be in the apartment uh, with candles and ice sandwiches because you didn't look at class and their economic situation or their budgetary situation. And so we have to really begin to take time, number one, to get to know people beyond our own bias and our own opinions. And then number two, to allow people the opportunity to share where these intersections fall in, because otherwise you may unconsciously be doing harm you may unconsciously be putting someone in a situation where they are gonna end up worse than they were when they met you just because you didn't take a chance, uh, take the time to get to know them. And I know we love to make people fill out 4,700 pages of forms. You could do it on your iPad. You could do it in PDF. You could scan it. You could do all of these things, but there are some things, because I know what them forms be looking like. I would choose to believe all of you have work with someone to make your forms better, but I don't know. Um, but I know what these forms look like. They don't tell a person's story. They just tell you what you need to know to build. 
They tell you what you need to know to get that evidence-based data for those grants. They don't tell you what you need to know about a person to ensure that you don't continue to put them in harm. And let me say something even deeper than that. You don't have to agree with the person's lifestyle. You don't have to agree with a person's choices. You don't have to agree with who a person decides to roll around in their queen size bed with to provide quality affirming care. No one is asking for any of you to step out of your Christianity, if, if whatever that doctrine of belief may be. No one is asking you to join anyone on the front of the pride line here in June with a big old flag. The only thing that is being asked of those of you in these community spaces is to provide equitable, humane, and affirming care to people who have come to you because they clearly need help. You can go home and have the same opinion you had before we started this class. You can go home and sit in your blackness and your whiteness and your maleness and your femaleness and your queerness and your bias, whatever that might look like if you have them. But our role, especially if we are taking a salary or an hourly wage in these community organizations is to offer humane, intersectional, and affirming care. So one part that we affirm those that we come in contact with early on is in their pronouns. Your pronoun, pronouns may be I, me, El, Elia, he, she, herself, you, it, that, they, each, few, me. all these are pronouns. Think about how many times you use these words over the course of a day to talk about the washing machine, to talk about the car. My car is a she, her name is Meg Stallion. And so she black, it's real cute, but <laughs> I stand black women, it's what I do. So we understand how to give pronouns to inanimate objects. So I do not know for the life of me why we can't figure it out as it relates to people once they share it with us. And I know it's difficult sometimes. Remember the conversation we had on uh, transitioning? Someone may look like their name should be one thing, and it may even be what you got on that piece of paper. And then they tell you that their name is something different. It might take your brain a minute to switch that thing up and to align it with something else. But it's no different um, when someone has a change in title. They used to be a community organizer and now they're director. You figure out how to call them your director when you talk about them. So pronouns, using pronouns, honors identities and lived experience. A lot of people who are hetero, heterosexual or um, who uh, have pronouns that match their biological uh, gender assigned at birth, cisgendered people um, are like, why do I have to put pronouns in my email signature? My pronouns are mind your business. Don't tell me. Okay, that's fine. Don't put it in there. But what it does when you do put it in there is it creates space for someone who has different pronouns to feel comfortable not only putting theirs in there, but holding people accountable for using the proper ones. So when you put your pronouns in there, in your email, when you say them at a meeting, when you share them on a button um, at an event or a conference, what you're saying is, it's okay for other people to do the same. It's an invitation into uh, affirmation. And it really does move towards belonging. I remember when I was um, kind of moving from this idea of the gender binary. And so I started, I moved from she, her to she, they. Because that way, if people still use she, I was like, well, it's okay. And I don't have to hold anyone accountable. See, because we live in this heteronormative, compulsory heteronormative society. I was more worried about the burden on other people to get the pronouns right. And then one day I woke up and had a bit of an epiphany. And that epiphany was, I can't manage other people and their ability to do or what not to do. I get to decide 
what who I am and how I want to be referred to. I don't care if I change my name tomorrow and every day subsequently after that. That if that is what I would like to be called, that's that on that. And and we've seen it done. We've seen people. Malcolm X name was not Malcolm X, and we all managed to to do that. And so belonging is you will respect me in our spaces and the way I show up, especially when it's not disrespectful, it's not harmful. Being affirming doesn't mean you let people cause harm or be disrespectful. Ooh, it's 12.50, Stephanie. My goodness, my goodness. Well, what time is it for you all? Uh, that's okay. not... 10.50 over here, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, blessings. Okay. So pronouns, gender identity, sexual orientations. Um, someone asked, will uh, you, you all be getting the slides? I will send the slides to the organizers um, and they are free to send those at their discretion to the folks that signed up. Um, practice. So perform an activity or exercise repeatedly or regularly in order to improve or maintain one's proficiency. No one is saying you have to walk out of here as an expert. You don't have to walk out here and teach it. If you want to, please do, child, because I'd be busy. I can't do all of it by myself. Um, but it's okay to get it wrong. It's okay to not have all the answers. This is why I always give book recommendations at the end, because what happens is, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you what I know, not what I think. What happens is in the next, I give it 90 days, you will, something will happen that will test everything I have said to you. Somebody going to say something crazy. Somebody going to come out of left field, out of pocket. There's going to be an issue at work or in the community. And you're going to be trying to remember, oh, Lord, what did Shauna say? I know she said something about something. I offer resources and recommendations so you can continue the work on your own. Because at the end of the day, um, it has to be in you. Like it, it's got to it's got to bubble up from you. How you have this conversation with others has to come from your own wealth of knowledge or experience. Otherwise, you start getting rattled in the conversation and in the argument. So it's okay to say, you know what, what you're saying, what you're doing is wrong. Um, and I cannot be in this space or uh, let's set up a time to talk about this next week, whatever the case may be, so that you can gather that information. Don't feel like you got to go out here and all of a sudden uh, become the, the great arguer or the great debater on this subject. So what happens when you get somebody's pronouns wrong? Apologize, but not in that weird way. And I think y'all know what I'm talking about when I say that weird way. There is a way that we apologize that we want to be absolved um, of what we did. I am so sorry. This is the worst thing that ever happened. Oh my gosh, my granddaughter is gay. And I am so sorry I have done this to you. And I just feel so bad. And I, Okay, get it together. Pull yourself together, draw those tears back up into your face. Because what has happened is now you put the burden on the person that you just misgendered. So now they feel bad because you feel bad. And before you know it, the person's like, oh, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I'm sorry. What did they do? Nothing. So apologize, correct, continue. Um, hey, I'm you say she and they say oh no my pronoun is he oh i'm sorry he keep going and then practice put yourself a sticky note on your computer uh make a note to self or and here is the radical part just call them by their name if you can't figure out pronouns then call shauna shauna call maria maria uh call donna miss donna don't be out here just trying to reinvent the wheel because you are having a personal mission. Call people by their name, the right name, not their dead names. Dead names are names when, when trans people or gender non-conforming people or when anyone 
actually gives you a name that they would like to go by. To call them by the other one is to dead name them. Depending on who that person is and why they change that name, um, what that means to them can be different things. So for a person who's experiencing gender dysphoria, um, gender dysphoria is when you are in misalignment with the gender that society has attached to you and the gender you know yourself to be. Um, it can cause depression, anxiety, um, suicide, all sorts of things because a person is in dysphoria. And dysphoria doesn't just happen with gender. It could be a person who has a eating disorder or disordered eating. Um, they see themselves one way and they want to be another way. That's dysphoria. And so calling someone out their name or not utilizing the name that someone has provided to you can be a source of a mental health issue and can cause harm. So this is what we would have done. It is 1054. I have until 1115. I'm not going to put you out in breakout groups, but we're going to talk about these together. So I'm going to raise the question and someone gets to answer. And I'll be trying to do real good and not call people. Um, but if you don't do it, just know I'm going to make Stephanie do it. And she is not going to like that. And so uh, the first question is, your 14-year-old niece tells you they are transgender. What do you do and what are your next steps? Don't all unmute at once. Shauna, we have Christine in the chat. She did say, I think firstly, I would ask their preferred pronouns. Yes. Tell them they are loved and respected. Mm -hmm. I love that. Adriana agree. Absolutely. Who can say what we will not do? What won't we do? Ooh, I, I can share what we won't do. We won't tell them, we won't just shut that down and we won't just tell them that that's wrong and you are not this and you are this. We won't do that. That's we what won't. I know that we won't do. <laughs> we sure will not do that. And we not gonna call our sister or brother and tell them either. We not gonna start the, I heard it through the grapevine. Cause it may be unsafe. There may be a reason they're telling you and not a parent or someone else. Now we can have the conversation with them about how, what, what do you wanna do to go forward? Um, what, how can I support you? What do you, what do you think will happen if you tell your mom or dad? What, what, you know, how are things at school? And really start getting some of that information. Now, listen here, I'm not telling you all of a sudden that you become their parent and take them to the places and all that. No, but start having a conversation about what can we do to help you feel safe? Are you afraid you're going to lose housing? Has something happened to make you feel like you can't share this with your parents? Would you like me to be there with you when we have this conversation? I'm not going to tell them but how can I support you in that process? Ms. Donna, we are not going to ask them why. Why are you trying to get the baby? Uh, we not doing that. Yes, Leah, we are going to make sure they feel safe. And Emily, yes, what an honor to be confided in. If you have been on the other end of someone coming out, just know it is because they presumed you were safe enough to. Don't let them down. Don't let them down. And I know for some of my parents in the room um, who had certain dreams and hopes, it can be hard when you know that your baby has identified in a way that is going to cause them harm, further marginalization, um, it may jeopardize their safety. But there are places for you to process that. If you're going through that situation, even now, send me a message, send me an email. Um, there are ways that you can learn, be educated. There are even ways to disagree 
and still be affirming and support that loved one and that young person without causing additional harm. And I would like to offer myself as a resource uh, for those of you who are experiencing that, or for those of you who are at an age where you're ready to cross over to the rainbow, not the rainbow bridge like pets, I'm sorry. If you're ready to, to make some other statements and decisions, uh, let me know. So uh, Jonathan, why won't you ask why? Great question. So when I say don't ask why, I would say there, I think there's a way to ask questions about it. That's not all, why do you feel like that? But to say what things are going on with you that helped you come to that? What, what, what is going on? Or uh, how long have you been feeling this way? How is that showing up for you? What does trans mean to you and your identity? I think those questions are perfectly reasonable. So when I say don't ask why, it's that judgmental, well, why? I, I know how we can be sometimes. Well, what's wrong with you? But I definitely think it's a good thing to begin to examine where they're coming from and what's leading them to that, especially at such a young age. Thank you for that question. Let me see what else is in this chat. Look at y'all chatting. Um, Emily says, I work with bilingual individuals who struggle with pronouns. Mm -hmm, is a kind way to correct them and it continues to happen. So depending on the bilingual, depending on who the person is, providing those pronouns in the language of the person. So um, I also know uh, bilingual people who from their language to English, it kind of gets um, lost in translation. And then if it keeps happening, recommend that they use a person's name. You know what? We not even gonna mess with these pronouns. I understand it's difficult for you, but it's also difficult for them to be misgender all the time. Let's just make a standard, let's set a boundary and just utilize their name, both in written form and in vocal form. Let me see, Jonathan, you said you, oh, here we go. Uh, so Jonathan asked the question earlier, how can we believe what a child says about their sexual orientation and things of that nature? Their children and their brains are not fully developed. Teen brains are not fully developed and they are not totally held responsible for their actions. In California, they're being let out of prison for one main reason, especially when they commit murder because their brains are not fully developed. Um, so how can I believe that a child knows exactly that because they were born a boy, but the age of seven is now telling me they are a girl? Fantastic question, Jonathan. So the first thing I'll say is that at seven, I don't know too many children that are talking about sexual orientation, but there are some that talk about gender identity. And I get the question all the time. Um, I have an 18 year old and there's still some things in that hippocampus and that Abdullah Oblingata, whatever it is, that got some work to do. It is said that we don't reach full adult status in our decision-making until 25 to 27 years old. But that has more to do with the logic and critical thinking aspect of our brain. When it comes to gender identity, um, and again, not to be um, conflated with sexual identity, when it comes to gender identity, it can be likened into things like, when I was young, I knew I didn't like carrots. When I was young, I knew what I liked to eat, what I didn't like to eat. I knew what color I liked or didn't like. I knew I didn't like to be tickled. I knew there were certain things I knew. Now, does it require investigation and examination? And by investigation, I do not mean state sanctioned policing. I mean, as a parent or a guardian doing your due diligence, does it require um, investigation and examination of what exactly is going on to make a person feel that way? Yes. At three and four years old, number one, that is too young to start gender affirming hormones anyway. So no one's transitioning at four years old, but it is a way to begin the conversation of the baby is saying they're trans because they want a haircut. They don't want this long hair that you be combing, brushing and doing all of that. Is it an identity issue or is it a preference issue? Is it, and some of those things, gender affirming care um, 
for most adolescents with affirming parents generally starts before puberty um, because there are a lot of things that that affirming care can prevent um, that helps with gender dysphoria. But you have to know your own children. Um, you have to be able to have that conversation. Having access to resources and gender affirming providers that can help you weed through what part is this and what part is that. Um, is very helpful. But I think, Jonathan, for me, it's not so much as to whether or not I would believe them. The question for me would be, how do I affirm them in a way that they know that the exploration is healthy and that we can continue to have conversations when it comes time to determine the best method and best means of care? Let me make sure I answered the question. I got to scroll down. Okay, okay, okay. And ultimately, and, and here, here's, a, here's a thing too to everyone. Um, as parents, ultimately we have stewardship and guardianship over these babies and over these children. And I do recognize that as parents, we determine and decide a lot ultimately about what their futures are um, up until they're adults, of course, and, and what care in our home would look like. My recommendation is to always just try to make that care as affirming and as open as possible. Your decision with your child may, may be or may not to be to make transitioning a part of your home um, and some of those other things. But I have seen and hugged and pastored and loved on so many children um, who have lost their families. So my recommendation, whether you believe them or not, whether you want it for them or not, whether ultimately you will decide to aid in their ability to seek gender affirming care is to very much try um, to provide an affirming and safe home. So Jonathan asks, how can you separate the gender identity and sexual orientation? If I believe I'm now a boy, a boy to girl, then sooner or later, I'm going to want a girl to have sex with. If I believe I'm a boy, that's not always true. That's not always true because gender identity and sexual orientation happen in two different ways. Uh, I know, uh, trans, I know males that have transitioned to female, that um, are in relationship with males. I know males that have transitioned to female that are in relationship with females. They are two very different things and very individual. So someone saying that their gender identity, because at four years old, um, barring traumatic experiences, I, I want to name that some people have uh, experienced things at a young age that have given has shown them more of this world than they were ready to see at a very young age. So at four years old, at six years old, first of all, sexual exploration is very natural at any age. By when a child gets old enough to identify body parts, they begin trying to figure out how this works. What does this do? What does that feel like? So that happens as young as two, three, four years old. But this idea of... Um, coitus, this idea of sex, this idea of intercourse um, is not a framed idea barring exposure until much later. So when it comes to gender identity, someone saying that they are of a trans identity, it that does not say what their sexual orientation will be. And it doesn't even mean they have a decision about that. There are some 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds, even now they'd be like, boys are yuck, girls are yuck, everybody is yuck, and I just want uh, to go to the movies actually. Um, there are adults who have no sexual uh, desire for anyone of any sex. Their sexual orientation may be ace because they, they just not into it. So they are very different things. I know it is a it is a difficult and controversial controversial idea and aspect to think about that because so much of the rhetoric, so much conversation around queerness and homosexuality um, has been given negative connotations. We've been assumed to be pedophiles. 
We have been assumed to be um, the drudges of society because of who we love and how we love. Laws have been written to prevent our ability to be in romantic relationship, to marry and all of those other things. But they very well are two very different things. Do, do, do. You are welcome. Thank you for asking, Jonathan. I appreciate that vulnerability. So what happens when I feel challenged? And me and Jonathan are a perfect example of this. Remain open. Jonathan, they'd be like, oh, girl, you crazy. I don't even like that. And that's, he might feel like that. But he asked the question. He received the answer. He having a snack. We are still good. That is how we discuss these things. Jonathan may walk away with whatever opinion he's going to have. I'm going to walk away with whatever opinion I'm going to have. But we were able to have a conversation about it. That's what happens when you're remaining open, when you're willing to learn and receive feedback without being connected to the outcome. Jonathan, Emily, um, those of you that have asked questions, Leah, they're asking questions wasn't about changing my mind, changing their mind. They weren't connected to that. The reality is we are all here together learning new things. How will we continue this journey? I'm always going, I am a voracious reader. I believe that our liberation begins at the library. Oh, I never said it like that before. I got to write that down. But I do. I really do believe that. Our liberation begins at the library with knowledge, with books, podcasts, audio books. Um, one of my favorites is Sister Outsider by Audre Lord, a poet, a novelist, a lesbian. Another thing uh, you can look into is the Cumbi uh, Collective Statement on Feminism. It's, it's very powerful stuff, very powerful stuff. Intersectional, Blackness, queerness, feminism, the differences that we experience as BIPOC people. There are uh, Latina women, there are Black women, there are Indigenous women that all contributed to that. Um, all Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. It is now a banned book, um, but it is a beautiful memoir of his life uh, growing up and his experiences with gender and, and sexual orientation. Another book by C. Riley Snorton is Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of Trans Identity. Um, a lot of people will say, oh, transness is for white people. Or, oh, queerness, that's that white people stuff. That's colonizer stuff. Uh, no, it ain't. It's not. Um, and so this is a wonderful walk through history um, on trans identity um, and what it is to be duly marginalized. So going beyond the talk, um, sometimes people don't always feel comfortable asking questions in these spaces, and I get it. Um, here is my email and my socials. Uh, you can shoot me some messages, ask your questions. If you're looking for some more specific books for your particular community, um, if you are currently experiencing um, any type of um, any type of LGBTQ gender diversity related things and have questions or your particular organizations needs consultation, let me know. Let me know. And as I said, if you are a parent, a loved one, or a guardian or someone in a child circle of influence that's experiencing, um, harm or questions around coming out, around gender identity, um, and you need additional resources, please let me know. If that is you yourself, um, also please let me know. This world is too big and uh, my heart is too big to let you go through that alone. Um, if you want to, if you got something crazy to message me and you don't like it, you don't like me, and you don't like nothing I talk about, don't send that to me. Send that to somebody else. Um, I understand that. I respect that. And my hope is that you walked away at least with an idea of how to better care for those in your work community and that you're able to do that in a healthy, safe and positive way. Thank you, Stephanie. I give it back to you with two minutes. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Shana, for such a wonderful presentation. If I could just have two minutes of your guys' time, just as we promised, here is the QR code um, if you did not sign in and weren't able to use the sign-in link in the chat. Here's the QR code. I'll leave that up for a couple of seconds. Okay. And then next week, um, our next workshop will be next week, February 21st on Wednesday, the same time, 10 a.m. to 11.15 um, a.m. Uh, the topic will be disability awareness and inclusion. So also you'll be re receiving a reminder. Also, if you guys would like to um, review this um, session again, this topic, we will be having it in our YouTube channel, which you can find in our link tree. I will provide that shortly. Lastly, thank you for joining us today. Again, happy Valentine's Day. We hope that you guys all have a wonderful Wednesday. Um, if you have any questions, we will stay on for a couple more minutes. But other than that, thank you guys again. Have a wonderful day. Bye, Jacqueline. And for everyone who's still here, did you guys have any questions, concerns, comments? Bye. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. You have a good Wednesday. I'm just signing in. <laughs> no worries, Tess, no worries. In that case, I'm gonna stop the record.